Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar titled Effective Supervision Strategies for Parent Support Providers. My name is Millie Sweeney with Family Solutions Consulting, and I'm presenting today on behalf of the Family Run Executive Director Leadership Association, or FREDLA. Jane Walker, FREDLA's Executive Director, was unable to be with us today, but she does send her welcome. This webinar is being provided as a technical assistance opportunity as part of the TA network. The TA network is a partnership with three other universities and seven organizations you see listed here. The TA network provides technical assistance to the Child, Adolescent, and Family Branch of SAMHSA's Center for Mental Health Services and to grantees of the Children's Mental Health Initiative across the nation to support states and communities to expand and sustain their systems of care for children, youth, young adults, and their families. FREDLA's mission is to strengthen the leadership and organizational capacity of family-run organizations that are focused on the well-being of children and youth with mental health, emotional or behavioral challenges, and their families. FREDLA provides technical assistance to system of care grantees and family-run organizations in the form of webinars, topic-specific consultation, site visits, resource materials, a leadership camp, and much more. We're excited that you've chosen to join us today to hear about effective supervision strategies to support parent professionals within agencies and in the field. The PowerPoint will be provided to you at the conclusion of the webinar. Please list any questions or comments in the chat box, and presenters will answer after the final presentation. As the workforce of parent professionals develops and grows across the nation, it has become increasingly important to ensure that they receive the guidance and support necessary to do their jobs effectively, as well as continue to grow in their profession. Today, we'll explore the different types of supervision, formats for delivery, and learn how several agencies and states are approaching supervision, including an example of developing training specifically for supervisors of parent advocates. Let's start with the two basic types of supervision in our field, administrative and content or services. Administrative supervision focuses on the HR or human resources aspects of staff support, including policy and procedure, timesheets, and performance. This type of supervision may also monitor staff training and strategic planning for staffing a program or agency. This type of supervision is usually conducted individually as it may deal with personnel issues such as attendance, disciplinary actions, or performance reviews. Content or service supervision has a focus on direct service delivery and case-specific planning or strategy. Programmatic issues may also be addressed, such as a change in required paperwork or training on a new assessment tool. This supervision can be clinical or peer in nature, as well as a combination of both. Supervision can be delivered in a number of formats, and this is often dependent upon agency preference program requirements, or staff needs. Individual supervision tends to focus on personnel tasks and individual staff development. Group supervision, however, is conducted with coworkers within a program. As a group, they review cases and brainstorm approaches or share resources, offer support for difficult situations faced by staff during service delivery, and receive information or updates in the program or agency. Professional development in the form of training or learning new skills is also provided. Dyad, or team supervision, occurs in programs where the PSP, the parent support provider, is partnered with a colleague, often a mental health professional, and receive case-specific supervision together. This can be provided if the team is within the same agency or are hired by separate agencies with the agreement for joint supervision. For example, a system of care site offering wraparound services may have a mental health specialist hired by a mental health provider agency and a family support provider hired by the family organization. They both serve the same caseload and may meet as a team with the program supervisor 
to receive guidance and support in serving those families. Agencies often use a mixture of formats, tailoring the supervision structure to fit staff composition or supervision topic and focus. For example, you may hold individual supervision monthly to address professional development and administrative issues, but have biweekly group supervision with the program team to provide case consultation and program updates. There are a number of models for supervision available in the behavioral health field, often specific to the staff role and responsibilities. The National Federation of Families for Children's Mental Health research supervision models for PSPs. In their brief, Best Personnel Practices and PSP Programs, there are three models recommended for effective supervision of parent professionals. The first is peer and outcome-based supervision. This is the, the delivery of both peer supervision and guidance based on enrolled parent and family outcomes and progress. The second is peer and clinical group coaching. That's the delivery of both peer supervision and group clinical supervision focusing on case-related issues. The third is group peer-to-peer -peer coaching. This, is, this uses a group format with other PSPs wherein discussions and brainstorming occur around case issues, skill building and support for use of lived experience and personal triggers that occur when working with other families. All three recommended models include an element of peer supervision, wherein a trained peer supervisor provides guidance on issues specifically related to the lived experience of staff. This includes identification of strengths and challenges, discussion about maintaining boundaries, addressing personal issues triggered by working with families facing similar challenges, maintaining identity as a parent professional, prioritization of tasks and skills coaching. This is a critical component for parent support providers due to the unique nature of their work and the fact that they are using their personal experiences and history rather than regimented training in an educational degree. Peer supervision explores both the professional and personal development of a PSP, addressing the emotional content of the work and the PSP's reaction, which, re which can affect their work with families. In addition to the inclusion of peer supervision, the best practice is outcome-based supervision. Examples of this type of supervision are the Targeted Parental Assistance, or TPA, developed by Kansas Keys for Networking, and the Family Needs and Strengths, or FAN, a form of the Child and Adolescent Strengths and Needs, also known as CANS, used by the Office of Mental Health in New York. Both have detailed training manuals and specific training protocols to ensure consistency and reliability in use. The TPA uses a 10-point continuum to guide PSPs in promoting specific skills in the parents with whom they work for parent outcomes and external outcomes. The TPA model uses supervision to build the skills of PSPs to assist families in skills development that lead to better outcomes. The FANS is a collaborative assessment used by the PSP and the parent. The 15-question instrument is used to identify areas of strength and challenge guiding the advocacy and support in decreasing parental stress, increasing knowledge and skills, and improving outcomes for both the family and the child or youth. In New York, the FANS is used quarterly as a tool of supervision to track outcomes and focus on service delivery goals. Supervision models are implemented in different ways nationally based on an agency structure, their approach to staffing, and resources. Next, we will hear three examples from the field detailing how their agency supervises the parent professional workforce, followed by an example of developing a curriculum to train supervisors in effectively supporting and guiding PSPs. We'll hear from Regina Kreider of Illinois, Lisa Conlon Lewis of Rhode Island, and Tony Donnelly and her colleagues from Arizona. Lastly, Libby Stoddard and I will present the process for developing and refining a training curriculum for parent advocate supervisors in Colorado. The remaining time will be open for, will be open for individual questions and comments from participants. I'll now turn this over to Regina Kreider. Regina? Thank you, Millie. Good afternoon. 
I'm Regina Kreider, the Director of the Youth and Family Peer Support Alliance. It is my pleasure to be on the call today to share about the supervision strategies um, that we use within our organization. The Alliance is a relatively new organization. We just established our 501c3 um, a year ago uh, this past March. As you can see, our staff breakdown is pretty simple, and we have a quick overview of who we serve. We serve caregivers in their school age youth up to 21 with severe mental health and emotional health issues, challenges, and disorders. We also serve families um, throughout the whole entire county of Champaign, and we are involved in the juvenile justice, child welfare, mental health, and education systems. We have one full-time peer supporter trainer, one full-time peer supporter, and one part-time peer supporter. We have one full-time youth supporter and one part-time youth supporter, with a total of 11 on staff, and out of that 11, eight are family members with direct lived experience. Our supervision model consists of inputs, outputs, measures, and drive for improvement. A relatively simple model that we have found to be effective, but is in the process of still being developed, considering that we are a new forming organization. Our inputs consist of productivity, oh, I got stuck, professional development, and clinical review. Today I'll primarily focus on our outputs. In March we produced productivity guidelines. This was incorporated because we needed to get a better idea of how time was being spent and if we were meeting our goals related to documentation and program outcomes. Included in our productivity guidelines is professional development and clinical review. Our, product, our productivity is weekly coaching, cons consists of weekly coaching. This is a structured one-on-one -on -one weekly coaching with our learning innovations facilitator, our LIFT. The LIFT is a, a peer with lived experience, and the LIFT is supervised by our operations director, who also has lived experience. The LIFT also spends most of her time, 80% of her time, in coaching, the peer supporters and 20% of her time serving families, which she has a caseload of two families, and in addition to providing community support by attending various activities within the community. In this, you will see a chart of our productivity and levels of coaching. For today, I'll focus on our level one coaching, but as you can see from this slide, we have a total of three levels. In our level one coaching, this is our intro, entry level of coaching, which will help the peer supporter to develop skills and techniques. Each new peer supporter is required to have two hours of coaching weekly. And they also have mandatory office hours, which is three hours a week. As you can see, in addition to our level two coaching, which we consider mid-level coaching, there's a development of active, active listening skills, effective communication, documentation, and enhancement skills, along with mandatory office hours, which switch from weekly to biweekly. And then there's level three coaching, which is our advanced level, which continues to build off of level one and level two coaching. And our level three coaching, which focuses on developing advocacy skills, enhanced problem solving skills as well, which is one hour of coaching, which turns into once a month. We're introducing a clinical review model currently um, and this will assist with providing clinical oversight, and this will also assist with creation of family goals based on the assessments that we use. And clinical review consists of three hours weekly. Um, the, clinical the clinical review team consists of 
people who are contracted from the community who are involved with our system of care and support those principles and values. So our level one coaching is pretty simple. Um, we have a timeline completion that we have incorporated where the peer supporter has an idea of how long it should take to uh, enroll a family and get started with them. We also have data and documentation entry into our um, fairness, which is our documentation collection system. We also work with our, our peer supporters during level one coaching with, to have meaningful contact with, uh, with their clients. They also focus on introduction to the primary functions of a peer supporter, advocacy, professional responsibility, mentoring, family support, and child development. And these areas are also covered during coaching, in services, and um, materials from our state certification. We also use a promotion system. So for an example, in order to be promoted from level one to level two, the peer supporter would need to pass a basic written exam covering the primary functions, which we're in the process of developing that at this time. The peer supporter would also get a recommendation from the learning and innovation facilitate, facilitator, as well as um, promotion recommendation has to be approved by the operations director. Our professional development consists of CANS training, developmental assets training, and there are oftentimes trainings offered locally on, that focus on child abuse, sexual abuse, IEP trainings, um, and other various types of trainings. We also provide peer supporters the opportunity to attend, attend various conferences, and we also conduct our own in services. Some of the challenges that we have faced with working with our peer supporters have been balancing work-life dynamics, which sometimes can be difficult for our peer supporters. Also, focusing on good self-care, because we know that sometimes our peer supporters can be overwhelmed and consumed by the work that they're conducting with their families and the importance of good self-care um, as a strategy for continuing the work. Another challenge that we face is maintaining documentation. Um, we have various documents that need to be completed in a certain time, fa uh, timely fashion, and sometimes this becomes very overwhelming and challenging for our peer supporters. Also keeping them staying on track with the family plan. When they go into the homes and work with families, helping them to make sure that the family plan is being worked on and continually to be moving forward. Because we are such a young organization, sometimes we have to change things in order to get the right balance to what we need to do. And we found that sometimes the peer supporters are resistant, resistant to that change. So that's an overview of our supervision model. As you can see, we are continuing to develop it over time because we are such a young organization. Thank you. Now I will turn it over to Lisa Conlon Lewis from Parent Support Network of Rhode Island. Thank you, Regina. Uh, you know, as we get um, it's to hear Regina, we have had all the same, even being around longer, we continue to have the same continuing challenges. I'm going to talk about two different program approaches that we're using within our organization. Um, the first program, which has been a foundational program we've had up and going since about 1991. And this is where our family members, I think right now we have about seven staff, all parents with lived experience playing this role, and they are really working to support a toll-free helpline. Um, that's actually an entry-level work that most staff um, within our organization play a role in, as do volunteers and family leaders. So it, it's a real foundational role within our organization. And as part of that toll-free helpline support, 
is be learning the um, really the resources that we have in, across different communities and statewide, beginning to do information and referral. And because many of our families, um, it's not as easy for them just to be able to get a phone number and take that next step. We do a lot of warm, warm transfers. Um, through that process, as a family could use some more individualized support and more one-on-one -on -one attention, we do a strength-based intake with our families. And then that steps them up to getting assigned to a peer mentor who can provide individualized assistance, which gets into goals and action steps, um, just even within an independent way, to actually um, working and being part of treatment and care planning meetings and working on very formalized goals and action steps with their team. Um, and this could be anything from going to education-related IEPs, hospital discharge, family court. We do the wraparound process, though we um, have another program where we have staff that I'll talk about that do much more intense with the one-on-one -on -one in care planning. We also offer individual and group parenting wisely, which is an evidence-based parent education program. And the individual is important because we have a lot of families who are formally involved with family core or child welfare, and based on their busy work schedules and trying to meet um, their mandated needs around that, we have found the individual works best for them. And then all our families, as part of that importance of outcome-based, as Regina was talking about, our families, as they go through a strength-based intake and become in, more involved with us, go through a family empowerment scale. And we do that at baseline. and six months and then continue it every six months. Um, our model, when a new person starts as a staff person for peer mentoring and or sometimes they are a family leader volunteer, uh, everyone will go through the formal PSN orientation. Um, that really learns the nuts and bolts and mission of who we are and our general policies and procedures and rules. Then we have a 16-hour introductory peer mentor training curriculum, which I'll show the components of that in a few minutes. From there, all staff, and usually longer, but at least two weeks of shadowing. And how shadowing works is I will be watching a, a seasoned peer mentor and listening while they're making the phone calls to them. We're going to reverse that role. And they're going to be able to listen in while the new person is doing more of that phone call and mentorship to now they're ready to be independent doing that. And we'll see shadowing go back and forth in, in most of the roles and activities that we do, even beyond the telephone support. And that's how coaching begins. Um, we have not only our formalized supervisor who provides direct supervision to the peer mentors, both individual and group, but it's very common that a seasoned peer mentor will take another um, new appear under their wing and help to provide ongoing coaching. Everybody receives individual or group supervision at least weekly. So if you're not getting your individual, you're participating in a group. And that sort of trades off every other week. Um, we offer monthly topical in-service presentations. Those are usually consistent and relevant to what are the trends and where we're seeing most needs of our families. And then we're big in regards to really being part of the network of all the ongoing community trainings and conference opportunities that are out there. And I would say that most of our staff average at least going to one to two outside community trainings and or conferences per month. And then now is um, the last couple of years where certification has been getting much more formalized we're working with our staff to, of course, get um, certified around our state Rhode Island RAP, also with the federation around the peer provider certification. And then in Rhode Island, we've also been developing a peer recovery specialist, which is broad in scope and certification that meets the needs of many of our peer mentors and our mission and approach. This is our, our peer mentor training piece. So this gives you a sense of what is collected within the 16 hours topics we're covering. Um, I'm not going to go through each of these, but it gives you a sense of the content that everybody's getting in those 16 hours. And then that's reinforced ongoing 
through the shadowing, coaching, individual and group supervision. Our second model pro of, of a program are our family support partners. And family support partners are, are providing much more intensive one-on-one. -on -one. And these are families that they are working with who are formally involved with the Department of Children, Youth, and Families, which in our state we're unique. So that would be families with youth, um, whether they're involved in child welfare for abuse and neglect, or voluntaries due to high-end behavioral health, where no fault of the parent, but more of a high-end behavioral health need, and or probation. And so we're working with families, and this is um, more as Millie was talking, a dyad team approach. So we are contracting with agencies who are also doing the wraparound and leading the care coordination. And so we are working to really partner in that team process. And we're doing the engagement and orientation. We're also jumping in to help meet a lot of those immediate and basic needs. We're huge bridge builders in building the communication between the social workers, care coordinators, and the overall team. Um, you know, we're working, again, another outcome base. Um, in child welfare, there's the need to do the protective um, capacity and risk assessment. So we're building onto that, and we're doing the protective capacity checklist with the families and helping the gain in on areas that they have non-negotiables or need to do, and we're measuring those outcomes. And of course, definitely celebrating their accomplishments as they take those steps. We also do the, the same family empowerment scale as part of that outcome, too. Certification is much bigger for our family support partners as they're required to go through all the basic wraparound training. They are getting the individual supervision. They're also participating in bi-monthly group supervision. And they're working hand in hand. We do dyad. So Millie had mentioned in the dyad, so we have a clinical supervisor from the agency providing care coordination. So, and then you have a peer support supervisor within our organization coming together with the care coordinator and the family support partner assigned to that child and family. And we'll all tr um, work on troubleshooting and trying to see how we need to go back and engage and connect. And it helps to keep us all on the same page together and to ensure that we're not duplicating each other's roles and providing best strengths. It's been a really great opportunity to really have that reflective learning between the parties and it's going well. Also, we're responsible within um, Parent Support Network. We have family support partners who are statewide beyond our organization. And we help to facilitate ongoing large group meetings between all the family support partners and lead efforts in self-care retreats. Also part of that certification of wraparound is being able to get all these other additional trainings to be certified. So we do a lot of safety and risk training, especially because of the population we're working with. In addition to wraparound, we're doing the data management. Uh, as Regina said, I think the, the data collection or documentation, progress reports, um, how to best write that, that's something that we're always providing ongoing coaching and support and troubleshooting around. We're also working to understand how to navigate the different systems. Um, visual diagnosis, again, because we're working with abuse and neglect, this is a very hard training. And we usually even have to do self-care in relationship to the training itself. Domestic violence, substance abuse, mental health, trauma-informed, and also PBIS. So we'll, we'll be working together. To, everybody has to have those done. And then they have to do direct observations. So within um, both our peer mentor program and family support partner programs, everybody's working together to make sure that they are actually going through individual observations. Here's an example. Um, I like to share this one because many of us use it across peer mentoring or family support partners. Foundational role of peer support is being able to share your own story, your ability to self-disclose as it's relevant. So with that in mind, we're actually practicing each of these skill sets 
And part of certification is being able to cut across eight module areas and be able to be proficient across all the skill sets. This is just an example of standard one. And finally, you know, some of our st staff selection um, is a huge piece as, as when you're first starting your description of who you're looking for and looking for that lived experience and a level of readiness. We've had to work on this in both levels where we've had some individuals apply and they had all the great lived experience, but they didn't have the ability to jump in and do the documentation and support and where they need to be. So this is where we've actually done some work to build leadership development volunteer to get them to a place of entry where they're really ready to be able to meet those certified requirements. And so we really developed our interview questions that help to get a sense of are people ready for these positions or, or what we need to do to get there. Um, again, being as proactive, we have a three-month probationary period where we say to the staff, this may be a good fit for you or us, and we're working on this together. And definitely by the time that the three-month probationary period is done, everybody has a proactive professional development plan in place. And even as I talked about some of those conferences or trainings that people continue within the community, they're also um, in alignment with those professional development plans. And again, we're able to, the more a person has that individualized professional development plan, it's a good reflective supervision approach to really being able to work back and forth together um, to, correct, do, to either prevent having to do corrective action or to begin to highlight people's strengths and or weaknesses and helping them to align and work on those areas. And then, of course, we do ongoing evaluations um, both at beyond the probation, we then do it at annual. And to, to me, you know, a long time to wait for an annual evaluation. So being able to have that professional development plan that's reviewed at least quarterly is our ability to, to have a proactive, because leadership development is ongoing. So we're, we're working together around that. I'm just checking to make sure there was um, group supervision and coaching is around, um, you know, we heard both in Millie's examples and Regina's examples, the more that you can be really clear during a group supervision or, or coaching session, if we're focused on a topic, so we're always bringing new topics and new areas to that learning. Group presentation, I think, is where everybody is learning the most. And that's where we're actually presenting the actual family scenario. And we're able to sort of say, this is how it's working for us. Here's the areas where we're trying to engage or learn more. Or does anybody have any strategies? And we learn and go back and forth with each other. Um, and I think we learn the most through group presentations, really being able to learn from our families. And then the more we practice our skill sets together is incredibly important because with those you know, practice rehearsals, if we're uncomfortable with each other, how confident are we going to be as we're trying to communicate with our families? On the flip side of that, I've seen some of our staff be incredibly comfortable with the families, but then when they have to perform or be observed in front of a supervisor, just the fear or knowing that you're being assessed can be overwhelmed for some of our staff. What I learned out in the field, especially family support partners that were employed by the agencies, um, there is a huge area around um, being able to self-disclose. So I had saw that family leaders were self-disclosing to the families they were working with, but their own supervisors had never known their own personal story or background, and that they weren't getting the level of um, self-care or support or flexibility they needed around their own family situation. So that's an area that our organization has been able to help everybody 
um, much more around. Um, I know um, there was one question around um, sexual assault. It is part of the required training. I might have just missed it, but we do have Sexual Abuse 101, and I believe they receive 8 to 13 hours. All of those trainings I mentioned are led by our Child Welfare Institute out of Rhode Island College. All are covered under CEUs, and um, so it is a part. So uh, greetings from the Valley of the Sun. My name is Tony Donnelly. I'm the Director of Training and Innovation at the Family Involvement Center. And with me uh, this morning here is Angelica Noriega and Candy Ludi. Um, we're taking a team approach to presenting on supervision since that is the way we model that within our organization. So again, those are just our names there. So let me tell you just a little bit about um, our staff composition. The Family Involvement Center is a family-run organization. Uh, we have uh, been in business here just about 13 years. Uh, currently, we have 52 employees. Um, and you'll see that we broke out primarily just the parent support roles for uh, this um, webinar. We have 34 employees in parent support roles. 80% uh, of our staff that are employed are parents. 100% um, of the families that staff our toll-free warm line uh, are also parents. Uh, we consider that warm line the hub of our organization and begin our training ground uh, there as well. Um, the other thing that uh, we find unique about our organization is that all of the uh, staff that are supervising parent support roles are parents. Uh, in our state, we also have uh, family support partners and parent partners employed at provider organizations, uh, and they don't always have the benefit of being supervised um, by a parent. And so subsequently, our state created a technical assistance guiding document, which you'll find at the end of our presentation, that talks a little bit about what kind of organizational infrastructure that an organization needs, including family runs, to really um, recruit, nurture, and retain the workforce. Um, we do a lot about supporting the growth and development of every staff, not only with um, intensive training, uh, specific to the role of the family support partner or parent partner, but also extensive training in working with a variety of other uh, child-serving state, uh, stakeholders. Um, we use a model that requires adaptive supervision, uh, supervision coaching, and mentoring. Um, many of our parent partners come to us with uh, different learning styles. Uh, and we really uh, use a model where, as supervisors, we're not requiring staff to change for us, but that we really supervise to a, a level that really meets their learning style. And so uh, we do a lot to supervise to strengths um, and then just help to grow and empower in areas where they need improvement. Um, we uh, value uh, personal experience and make many accommodations uh, for staff family needs um, in terms of flexibility of schedule, perhaps um, flexibility for family leave, as well as considerations for having uh, staff sons and daughters come to work periodically. Uh, the other thing that is, we feel is important in terms of organizational infrastructure is providing both formal and informal opportunities for our um, parent staff to connect with others with lived experience. Many times they're holding um, all of the pain of the families that they're working with and don't have a venue to talk about what's going on with their own family. And so we provide ongoing formal opportunities once a month for our staff to come together and get support as a family member um, and going through their, the challenges with their own families. 
Um, in addition to organ, uh, organizational infrastructure, we also believe there are some programmatic supports that really need to be in place to effectively supervise uh, these parent partner roles. And the first is the appreciative capacity of a supervisor. Uh, and here, um, our hope is that supervisors really do respect and honor the role that a family member brings regarding their life expertise. And sometimes that also means that they bring a different opinion to the table than those who might um, have formal education experience. Uh, we believe in a strong commitment to protect the integrity of the role of parent support partners, to do what the role was initially intended to do, and not have them do other roles uh, that might be assumed by other team members, such as being a case aid or providing um, meal boxes only. Um, we believe in an ongoing commitment to assure equal status for the roles. And here, what we're talking about is, uh, while many people bring their educational expertise to the table, we also value the lived experience that our staff are bringing. And depending on the years of experience, we equate that in uh, terms of salary as well. Um, and then again, uh, that the role is meaningful, uh, that they have some independence in terms of supporting uh, the families that they're working with. And so here is a, a visual of what our current supervision model uh, looks like. At the very top, you'll see that we have a team of individuals, primarily our program manager staff, that triage uh, and provide individual supervision by assigning, um, they make the referral assignments for a parent so that not only are we giving the parent the right match of support, but they are also fitting them with the best parent partner um, and also in the development of their family support plans. Um, and in this area, we're, uh, the supervisor is spending a lot of time um, developing engagement strategies along with uh, the assigned parent partner that they're working with. Um, in our state, um, as part of our organization is part of a clinic and Medicaid um, uh, eligible families work here and we're, we are um, required under the Office of uh, Behavioral Health Licensing to provide clinical oversight at least once a month and then team supervision every two weeks. Uh, and you'll see that um, illustrated here as well. Um, we uh, currently have uh, five different teams. Uh, we're not focusing on team five today because that's primarily our youth mentor program. But we provide face-to-face uh, -face clinical oversight uh, for our um, parent assistance center, which is our warm line. And then for those staff who are serving families either, either moderately or intensively uh, in our in-home and community-based programs. In addition to that, we have a, a, a team in Arizona. We actually have offices in Flagstaff and in Prescott Valley, which is more a uh, part of our rural Arizona. And our clinical oversight, which is comprised of both myself that brings a parent perspective and our clinical director uh, that meets with each of these groups on a monthly basis to provide um, ongoing supervision. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like in the next slide. So our monthly clinical oversight is a co-supervision model. Uh, I'll bring the parent perspective and our clinical director uh, also brings his clinical expertise. Uh, we do this in a very formal way. Um, and what I think is interesting, and you'll see reference to this in the web, web links that I put in here, that clinical oversight is really a dynamic collaborative process that allows um, components of teaching and mentorship that encourages uh, self-assessment and reflection uh, of our staff, as well as the development of analytical and reflective skills. Uh, our aim is really to enable the supervisee to develop and sustain a high quality of practice. Um, during our clinical uh, oversights, we may uh, 
discuss uh, certain training topics, but we really allow for a long um, opportunity for deep reflection of practice. So staff members can bring um, families that they're working with in terms of seeking uh, family consultation. Um, and at the completion of this, our staff write a supervision note to their direct supervisor regarding their reflections of the meeting. And we use that in ongoing team and individual supervision as well. So I'm going to turn this over now to Candy Ludi. She is one of our program managers who provides um, direct supervision to staff um, in home and in the community. Go ahead. Okay, sorry about that. So Tony had talked a little bit about our co-supervision model. So we have our moderate support and our intensive support. And so before we assign families, we have our family consultations and brainstorming. So the program managers get together and decide who's going to be the best fit to support the family. And then we meet together to address those specific, um, specific needs as a team um, because we feel like not only one person has something to offer, and so each supervisor, um, we really do work with the co-supervision model. If one supervisor is not available, the staff go to the other supervisor, as well as the clinical director. Um, we really work um, very closely to acknowledge and celebrate successes with our parent partners, um, and we do the supervision notes submitted um, directly to the as soon as we're done with supervision um, to the supervisor. Our individual supervision occurs at least weekly in our team. Um, we do an assessment of personal well-being first. Again, that self-care is most important when working with the, with the parent partners um, due to the level of intensity they work with with some of our families out in the field. Um, we also review the individual pro professional development plan um, where we focus on the strengths first. And then we move on to challenges and, and work on getting some real clear focus on what areas we really need to work on. And we come up with goals and strategies to get them there. Um, and then we talk about resources, how we're going to get there. And then we get a timeline and we revisit those, usually um, at least once a month. Um, and then we look at the assessment of where some of the training needs are for some of our staff, because some of our staff are at different levels. So we provide the training that, that they are needed at that time. We do individualized training, coaching, and mentoring. And, um, and Helen is going to talk a little bit about that here um, later on. Um, some of the strengths that we feel are very important here, um, you'll see um, part of our, one of our um, program managers up in Flagstaff um, quoted, it, we used her quote, parent support partners are as important as the families we serve. Um, because we are parents with the lived experience, and we try to really focus on that hiring process and, and how they're going to fit in here at the Family Involvement Center. And we try to put them in the position um, that's going to make them successful. We are very flexible when um, meeting with our staff where they are, um, especially at their level of um, engagement with families or um, maybe with their own personal uh, well-being. Um, <coughs> the importance of our supervisors to be available and our phones don't go off at 5 o'clock kind of thing. Um, knowing that our staff um, are supervising to our parent partner strengths, um, we are really good about cultivating the growth in our, our parent partners um, and giving them um, steps towards success. Um, we adapt ourselves to their um, learning styles, and we provide that interdepartmental team support again because we're all one big family here, um, hence Family Involvement Center. We try to come at it as a complete team approach. Um, and our supervisors are one of the very important strengths that we make sure that we have as supervisors that we're teachable and that we're willing to learn with our staff. Um, we don't know everything. Um, um, we are really um, striving to understand the culture of the parent workforce. Um, and make sure, again, that we are giving the staff appreciation and recognition. We also have the ability to think outside the box. Um, working with Medicaid dollars, you have to be real creative on how you're going to find support. Um, again, promoting the self-care. Um, regulating distress, we, you know, we um, have some opportunities here. And we're big on food at the Family Involvement Center, I think, so we provide a lot of um, distress by um, that. And then we also provide um, 
the CQI, which is our continual quality improvement. And then we really focus on that intentional support, you know, being intentional about who we are supporting and why we are supporting. And now I'm going to give it over to Angelica. Thank you. Um, let me, let me. I'm going to talk about the workforce strengths. Um, our parent partners, um, they have a variety of experience and knowledge. Um, we recently did a strengths inventory that highlighted each individual's um, knowledge and expertise. Um, our workforce have a lot of lived experience. We know firsthand what it's like to sit on the other side of the table, uh, which I think is a plus, makes us very understanding of each family that we support. Um, we support, like Candy said, we try to match the, uh, the needs of the family to the parent partner um, so that they can offer that uh, family support with a common background rather than coming at it as an expert and having all the answers. Uh, we use their uh, personal experiences as a learning and healing tool for families. Um, we help um, ensure the family voice is not only listened to but heard. We sit on a lot of teams. Um, in a variety of ways um, where we're doing that. Um, we are bridge builders. We always strive to build and nurture uh, sustainable partnerships between the family members and professionals. We find um, a lot of families um, don't feel heard, therefore they feel disconnected, but we work really hard on building those bridges with the professionals. We do need professionals, um, but we also need to help our families and our professionals connect, so oftentimes we are building bridges between them. Um, commitment, we are committed to non-judgmental non and respectful interactions. Um, we are a natural support to each other, oftentimes, um, you know, again, speaking on what we've already talked about, um, we also need that support ourselves, so um, because we do work very closely, we often um, look to each other for some support. Um, we're always instilling hope, and we are good at modeling resiliency in every interaction that we have. Um, continued, I think we need to move the slide. Sure. Oh. Um, some continued workforce strengths. Um, we focus on the whole person, not the problem. Um, we're committed for the long haul. Uh, we um, promote non-adversarial advocacy approach. We're passionate. We have a never give up attitude. We're definitely adaptable, uh, willing to expand our knowledge in the field um, across child serving systems. Uh, we have extensive knowledge of each other's families and support them when needed. Uh, kind of what Candy was talking about, we work in a team approach. Um, one example could be there's a, someone working with the family intensely in the home. Um, and when the uh, parent partner is not available, they are promoted to call the Parent Assistance Center um, so that they might be able to get some resources or some telephonic support. Uh, we like to celebrate successes with families. Uh, we help keep the teams honest. Uh, we like to keep it real. And we have a family-driven approach. Um, one of the things I'd like to share is that parent partners are often the first ones to see firsthand the needs of the families. Um, and that is also one of the strengths that we bring to the team. Some of the workforce challenges um, is the uh, lack of knowledge and community resources available to the families they serve. That goes into um, ongoing trainings that we try to um, be on top of. The geographic location assignments, um, the rural and the urban. Um, long distance supervision of the rural staff. Um, some of the challenges also around time management, documentation, which people have already identified as well. Um, staff, you know, must be tech and system savvy. Um, but with that, we also, because we know that not everyone is tech and system savvy, um, we provide them technology um, such as recorders, iPhones, to make documentation easier. Um, we also have how-to templates on different um, things that we pick up that is a challenge for staff. Uh, we have a place where they can go to how-tos and pick up on different ways to document, um, just a variety of things. 
Um, another challenge would be um, knowing when and how to share their story, work-life balance, personal and professional boundaries, navigating dynamics of cultural differences. Um, workforce Development Manager, that's my role. It's a new role for, for the Family Involvement Center. Um, this is a full-time um, um, job. It provides on-site one-on-one -on -one coaching of supervisors for cer fixed certification standards um, and the skill sets to help the supervisors increase staff competency. Um, also involves development of individual professional development plans with the program managers and the people they supervise. Um, the professional development plan it really helps staff to create and reach their own personal growth. Uh, we provide some weekly meetings with supervisors. Um, because program managers are very connected to their staff, um, they tend to track trends within um, the workforce they support, and so those trends um, will become our agenda items for group supervision. So they're very um, staff driven, which in turn really is driven by the families, but we're really paying a close attention to that, um, and that's part of Hold what on. we do. Oh, oh found a roll. We got disconnected again. I think they can tell you're talking though. There you go. Okay, we're back. No. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. okay great. I had left off on the development of our uh, um, group agendas, and they're driven by staff. Program managers work really closely with their staff and pick trends that are happening um, day to day, and that usually goes into the development of our uh, group agendas for group supervision. Um, another aspect of that is um, the workforce development manager is knowledgeable of all the teams and provide supervision when needed, um, including vacation coverage. Um, and so because we're very cl uh, we work very closely, it's really simple to do that um, and kind of step in where needed. And also um, being able to provide observations and feedback. So this goes along with the coaching. Um, and then working with the triage, triage team and engaging the families to determine the right fit and the match of support. Um, we are working on a model of support that can support families through the variety of systems. And we're um, just in the middle of that. And that's going to provide the uh, staff the skills needed to provide the support as a parent partner. Um, this will help with help parent partners being able to work with families uh, with systems such as the Arizona Department of Corrections and Department of Child Safety. Um, here are a few websites that we want to, links that we want to provide to you guys. Uh, the Arizona Department of Health Services.gov has a guidance practice protocol. Um, and then they also have um, a family and youth document. This was written, which is the second um, on your list. This, was, this document was written by family leaders in collaboration with the state. And with the third link is the um, Behavioral Health Services Covered Services Guide. So that concludes our um, portion. So Millie, do we turn it to you now? We'll hear from Libby Stoddard and then I'll follow her. Okay. So Libby, go ahead. Thank you, Millie. And hello from Colorado. Um, here in Colorado, we have defined family advocate and family system navigator in legislation. Um, the first was a House bill in 2007 that was specific to a juvenile justice mental health focused program. And that was where we first defined family advocate, as you can see on your screen, as someone who has raised or cared for a child, youth, or adolescent with mental health or co-occurring disorder and working in multiple agencies 
um, and with providers, including the mental health, physical health, substance abuse, juvenile justice, developmental disabilities, and other state and local systems of care. And also the family advocate um, has been trained in a system of care approach to assist families in accessing and receiving services and supports for their children. The family systems navigator is defined as an individual who has been trained in a system of care approach to assist families in, and children and youth with mental health or co-occurring co disorders in accessing and receiving services and has been trained w in working with multiple agencies and providers. Um, that particular bill sunsetted and so the second bill which was passed in 2011 continued the program without any financial allocation and required the, our Office of Behavioral Health to uh, provide the technical assistance for the rules and standards um, of the program. We in Colorado were fortunate enough to receive one of the SAMHSA, the current SAMHSA system of care grant implementation grants. Here in Colorado, it's statewide with 16 counties participating, which we, we call those 16 counties communities of excellence. Uh, and each of them have very specific requirements to participate in our grant, which includes having a family advocate which we refer back to the legislation for a definition. Um, as we moved forward, we had consistent requests from each of the grant sites for technical assistance around supervision and how do we supervise this newly required workforce because many of the areas did not have experience working with peer family members. So the Federation of Families for Children's Mental Health of Colorado Chapter contacted Family Solutions Consulting LLC to explore the possibilities of developing a test site um, which was going to be funded through our system of care grant monies. So we worked so with Millie of Queenie, and I'll turn this one over to you, Millie. Okay, thank you. Um, in developing the curriculum, it was important to bust the myth that was out there that parents are difficult to supervise. Um, in fact, supervising parent support providers is similar to supervising any workforce. There are basic components of any supervision, um, administrative tasks, performance and case specific issues, professional development, and some that are very specific to the role, um, such as the use of lived experience in a professional role and the need for peer-to-peer -peer support. The curriculum we developed is structured across two days. Day one focuses on the role of the supervisor, the stresses and the rewards of being a supervisor, how supervising parent support providers or parent advocates in Colorado is different from traditional mental health providers, but also has many similarities, the need for both clinical and peer supervision elements, creating a supportive environment, and honing skills in the developmental approach to supervision. Day two gets into the specifics of three main supervision areas, case supervision, performance, and professional growth. The training covers the topics to be addressed in each area, how to document supervision, Handing, handling disciplinary actions, and supporting ongoing training and professional growth of parent advocates. Now, at the end of day two, the participants take a 30-question assessment that they have to pass at 85%. The trainer also completes an assessment of each participant to note their readiness to supervise parent professionals based on trainer observation of each during the activities and the discussion that occurs across the two-day period. The trainer notes the strengths and the weaknesses, as well as provides suggestions for further training on certain topic areas if it's needed for that candidate. In Colorado, 
the curriculum will be required for all parent advocate supervisors, and both the training and the supervisor certification will be provided by the statewide family organization, um, which is the Federation of Families in Colorado. Libby? Thank you, Millie. Um, as Millie mentioned, we developed the curriculum over three months and um, worked together by email. Millie um, is a, an amazing partner to work with. Uh, our first class was in October of 2014, and we had nine participants. Um, the first exam that we gave, unfortunately, two of the, the class had to leave early and were not able to take that exam, which actually I think in the long run helped us because we got a lot of feedback from that the seven participants who did take that first competency exam that had, and they had suggestions of how to improve it. One of the participants comment to the, one of the people who had left was, don't worry about the test. I think it's impossible. Of course it wasn't, but that was his view. So um, Millie and I spent some time going over what we were told and what we uh, were hearing from the participants. And Millie then made some adjustments and developed a new exam. And it wasn't completely new, but um, taking into consideration the feedback that we had received from the participants who had taken the exam. And then I was able to administer the written exam to the two participants who weren't able to take the first round of the exam and both passed with flying colors and their feedback was very positive indeed. So. Uh, obviously, the changes were good ones that were made for that. We have now been um, out for seven months with people using the training, and uh, we have gotten mixed feedback. I've had several um, people who responded when I asked how it was going that they were so busy they didn't have time to talk. We have had a couple of people who have had issues with uh, having a family advocate employed continuously. So they really don't feel like they have had a chance to use their new skills. But we've had two of the family um, advocate supervisors who said that they are so glad that they had the training because they have been able to be that family advocate advocate that Millie was talking about in the previous slide and that they themselves have been able to understand the role of the family advocate and the importance of that lived experience and sharing that lived experience with families. And they have been able to take that knowledge to other systems professionals to be the voice of advocacy for the family advocate. If I could add so in. Thank you. Um, uh, some of the things that, that we looked at um, based on the feedback um, in the exam was having more application questions rather than content questions. It's a lot of information to cover across two days. Um, initially, it was a day and a half, and we decided that it really does need to be a two full days um, with more activities such as role plays. Um, so that's another change that's been made. Um, this group was aware at the beginning that they were our guinea pigs um, for this, <laughs> and it will be interesting to get their feedback um, whenever we show them the updated version, uh, because we did try to take into account what their experience was, just like we do with the family advocate. Libby, was there anything else you wanted to add? No, I think that covers it. Thank you. OK. What we will do now is move into um, questions and answers. There are um, a couple of questions that people have uh, typed in the chat box. Um, first of all, the PowerPoint is going to be available, um, and uh, the institute is going to add that as a handout 
um, actually that's happening right now, you should be able to access it. Um, there was a question from Terry about the certification. Um, and I think that there was reference to the national certification that is through the Federation of Families for Children's Mental Health, but also a number of states have certification of their own. Illinois has their own certification, as does Rhode Island, um, and uh, so does Colorado. Um, so if um, there are, there's a specific question about that, maybe, Lisa, if you could say something about Rhode Island certification and Regina. Uh, if you would also speak up about that, and then maybe Libby. Hi, this is Lisa. Can you guys hear? Can you hear me? Okay, Millie. Yes. Okay. So um, we are. Um, we're in the stages. Um, the certification that we have agreed to be using right now within Rhode Island is called the Peer Recovery Specialist, and we work together across adults. Um, families, or parents, and, and children, so all of us, and youth peer support, so we have a common definition. And now the certification through what's now the Rhode Island Certification Board. And that's about 46 hours of um, skill-based training, face-to-face, -face, and then 500 hours of supervision. And then from there, what we learned is, um, as people may be aware, the, the federation certification, the national certification, is, is more intense than that, especially around the levels of years of experience and putting your portfolio together. So what we are usually encouraging is, we, one, we made sure the work that we're doing in state builds upon and, and supports development towards national certification, but many times, um, at least in the first couple years of employment, our staff would not be able to reach the, cert the national certification standard. So they're working together. Um, I don't have the exact criteria for the national in front of me, but it is much more than what I'm sharing within Rhode Island. And the, and the supervisory model for our Rhode Island piece becomes incredibly important because you have to have, the supervisors have to reinforce that you're meeting the core domains, especially around ethics, advocacy, select, um, you know, really knowing how to navigate services and community resources, and also around the whole wellness and, and self-care. Thank you. Regina? Illinois has two levels of certification, don't they? In Illinois? Yes. Um, no, we, well, of the the certification that I know about, we have a um, certified family peer partner um, certification process on the state level um, that I'm aware of. Um, it's competency-based. It's the development of your portfolio that you submit to the state. They provide a manual for you to utilize to study to prepare for the uh, test. Um, the test is, in order to test, the cost. Um, $150, um, and it, it's uh, $150 uh, that has to be paid up front. Um, once they review your portfolio, then they'll allow you to take the test, um, and then they'll send you your certificate, and you have to maintain your certification um, and reevaluation, I believe, it's every two or three years. Um, our certification process um, is listed under what we call Rule 132, which is Medicaid billable in, um, in uh, Medicaid billable agencies. Our specific agency is not Medicaid billable. Uh, so one of the things that our state is moving towards through our system of care expansion um, implementation grant is moving towards having peer support um, guidelines set in our Medicaid billing, because at this point, it's not Medicaid bill, um, in our Medicaid billing. So that's what I know about our certification process. Thank you. Um, Libby? You're um, Libby our you process here, yeah, I can. Um, our process here in Colorado, 
sounds very similar to what is going on in Rhode Island and Illinois in terms of uh, requiring training and supervision. We are still in the process of defining all of those elements. We um, have applied to a national, actually international credentialing group that um, includes not only our family advocates, but also um, adult peer specialists and recovery coach and hopefully the youth peer specialist. We did a combined core competency of those roles uh, document that has been included in our Medicaid contract that went out to the local mental health centers. So we've made some inroads there. but. Um, we have uh, probably another six months before we will have all of the pieces of the certification defined. Okay, thank you. Um, and Arizona also has a certification and credentialing process. Um, so here in Arizona, currently we're working with um, both the uh, um, individuals who are pri uh, providing adult family support as well as the children's system. Uh, our state is moving forward with a uh, credentialing process very similar to what they did for um, peers and in which we developed the components that we'd like to see in training on both the children's side and the adult side. So they will be certifying the curriculum and then as a group, we'll be developing the standardized testing that will occur. And so uh, while the state will certify the curricula or the training components and skill-based competencies, what the Family Involvement Center has done through Angelica's role as Workforce Development Manager is we are individually certifying all of our staff to be certified to deliver family support, as well as encouraging them to get certification um, at the national level through the um, um, Federation of Families for Children's Mental Health. Okay, thank you. Um, I will say that in Tennessee, um, which is where I live, um, we do have a certification process in place that just became uh, billable. You have to be certified in order to bill Medicaid, which is TennCare in our state, as of January 2014. Um, and so that, that was a big process. Um, let's see, Lisa is answering by typing uh, Celeste's question. Uh, there was another question about um, is there a reason sexual assault is not part of the required training. I think that is for Rhode Island as well. And, and, and I think I clarified that. So I think on two levels, I think if we're talking about in regards to if a staff person um, could be prepared or, could, or became sexually assaulted in the workplace or on home visits, we do orientation and more um, work around that just in general, around safety in general. But then we also have um, super, we have a, a I believe it's sometimes eight or maybe even two days of sexual abuse and assault more in relationship to the families we're working with. So we are doing it on both sides. I, I, actually, it was a good catch in my slides that I saw that, that there's actually two or three trainings in there that didn't make it into the slide that um, even more comprehensive. And I think we continually try to increase that, especially as we're working with child welfare populations. And it's a big self-care area because we have staff, you know, where a dad has maybe been charged with sexually abusing his own child. And then how do we provide um, continued focus around um, the work that needs to be done there between the child and family, but also the self-care of what that's like for a staff person having to work with a um, family member that has been charged with sexual abuse. Thanks, Lisa. Um, we have just about uh, eight more minutes. Um, if there are any other questions that anyone would like to type. Okay. 
think we may have one more coming in. And again, you can access the um, supervision uh, PowerPoint um, in the box below where it says PowerPoint download below the chat box. It looks like we don't have any more questions. Um, so I want to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. Um, on each one of the transition slides are the email addresses um, for the presenters if you have additional questions. Um, and again, feel free to download the PowerPoint and use that. Um, I hope you have a great rest of the week. Um, thank you again.